The second part of uh, learning module three has to do with energy cost of physical activity, which is chapter six. So let's review a little bit here. Energy cost of any activity. Energy is the capacity to perform work. And work, which could be related, which uh, different words for work could be effort, exertion. In this case, it's physical activity. It could also be exercise, employment, etc. Because we, when we go to work or exercise, then we are performing work, force times distance. Or how much for we, force we exert on an object over a distance per unit of time. So that's what work is. And we know that work is force times distance. And work over time is our power output, our rate of doing work. That's what power is. So every activity we perform has a certain power output. And every activity requires energy. So if we, let's look at the physical activity of your client or any participant. How can the current activity be tracked? What kind of activity and how much work they're actually doing? Is it aerobic versus anaerobic? And most information in tracking calories used during aerobic act activity. So let's say that again. Most information is about tracking calories used during aerobic exercise. And how does one track energy output during anaerobic, i.e. resistance training? Is the intensity slash activity appropriate for achieving the appropriate target heart rate? Is the volume, i.e. the energy cost, sufficient for health gains? So that we have a little bit more information about that from chapter 11. And is the volume, i.e. energy cost, sufficient for weight management. Most of our uh, information here is going to be about aerobic exercise. Now let's look at the strength and weakness of all these different types of uh, abilities to track uh, exercise. We have self-reported levels, we have a pedometer, accelerometer, heart rate monitor, and power output work over time, particularly in resistance training. So self-reported levels. Question, we have questionnaires slash or interviews. They're quick and inexpensive. However, the questions can be misinterpreted greatly. We also, too, have problems with failure to recall all the activities along with the intensity of every activity. How much, how long, how hard. Because a lot of times if you wait too long before you write it down, we can lose uh, memory of just exactly what we were doing. A pedometer is nothing more than a device that tracks the number of steps a person takes. This can provide information as to the distance travel when stride length is programmed into the device. It's inexpensive and easy to use, but the drawbacks are no information as to the intensity of the, ex of the activity, which in this case is walking. We don't know how fast we're going. We just know we go, we do a number, uh, number of steps, you know, the length of the step we do and how many steps we're doing. Cannot be used with non-locomotion activities. Can't be used with biking. And the stride length measurement accuracy. Do we really know, have the average of our stride length uh, when we do, how can we measure that? So that has to be programmed accordingly. Accelerometers, these are the devices that are worn on the arm, hip, leg, or foot to track acceleration of a body. Devices are also available to attach to lifting bars, machines, etc. They're just, just not for aerobic activity. Supposedly provides information about the intensity, duration, and frequency of physical activity. Now, we must note here, these devices are made for both aerobic and anaerobic activities. And anaerobic activities are referring to both sprinting and any type of resistance training. Handheld devices are available to attach to the device, like a, a lifting bar, a machine, a sled, uh, any kind of uh, um, apparatuses like that, that either have a readout or can be downloaded to a computer. So we can, doubt, we can attach it, do our uh, data collection, and then download the computer to review it. They're expensive with some devices only known to certain groups for specific measurements. And let's get a look at an example of that. This is called a Tendo unit. They use it in weightlifting a lot, whether it's powerlifting or Olympic lifting. 
It easily hooks to the barbell, this is what we were talking about before, uh, to a plate stack or to an athlete. It measures the velocity in meters per second up to a 2.6 meter range. So for moving the bar a certain distance, it'll track how far it's moving it. And also the measures the velocity, you know, the average velocity of that bar from point A to point B up to 2.6 meters. If the proper mass of the bar athlete has been entered into the microcomputer, the unit gives power output as well as velocity measurements. Because we look at it's work over time, then we look at force time distance divided by time, then if we look at uh, displacement or distance divided by time, that's velocity. So that's what it's measuring here because that's what power is, force times velocity. So once again, it'll give a power output as well as the velocity measurements. It can give a percentage of maximum power output and maximum velocity. It can also track the number of repetitions and it's, it's adjustable limits with audio signals. In other words, you can tell if, if you set it for a certain speed or velocity that you want to achieve, if you either go above or below that velocity, it'll beep. Uh, it'll be, you know, certain types of beeps if you go over it or exceed that, or if you go below it, it'll beep in a different tone. So they actually, they're, they're pretty good tracking devices if, you're, if, you're, if you really want to track power output and distance travel, then you can, you can actually put that into different calculations and figure out how many calories you're burning in joules per second or watts. Heart rate monitoring, it's great for measuring intensity of physical activity and measuring the heart rate. But this is measuring physiological work, not mechanical work, it's physiological. And it stores it, you can store data over days and it's easily downloaded to your computer for analysis of intensity, duration, and frequency and activity bouts. So how long, you, if you have a heart rate on for a certain amount of time, you can track um, how long you were exercising. Intensity is based on how high your heart rate was and your frequency of bouts during the activity. If you go fast, slow, you know, like interval training. You go fast, you know, work rest ratio is what you can measure. Because you can see, and as it's a printout, it'll show your heart rate going up and then going down, going up and going down. So you can keep track of that, just look at the, how many bouts of high intensity versus low intensity. The drawbacks include heart rate affected by meals, heat and humidity, and training status. More the more fit the individual is, the intensity of the exercise, they must increase or maintain the same heart level. Let's review that again. So let's say you're doing an activity and you reach uh, max heart rate of 150 at this particular intensity using a particular weight or speed of something. Well, as you adapt to that exercise, you know, your heart rate's gonna, gonna go down because remember the physiological changes that happens to the heart? So you, for over a period of time, you may use the same intensity, but your heart rate is not as high. So therefore, you have to increase the intensity of the exercise, either add more weight, go faster, or more resistance on that particular device to get your heart rate to go back up, because that's going to make you work harder. So that's, that's one of the drawbacks on that. And there's a lag time for heart rate to increase or decrease at the start at the end of, of a session. So we have to look, take that into consideration as well, but it is... A uh, pretty good way to keep keep track of uh, of your workouts. So, if we relate physical activity and health outcomes across all tracking methods, we want to convert measured physical activity levels and see how much energy is expended. What we're looking for is how many calories are we burning. So, direct calorimetry is transferring the body heat to water. And what this is, this is very costly. This requires um, a very expensive chamber. The cha it's a big chamber where you can put a treadmill in, um, you can put a cycle in there. Um, and what it is, it's covered with this um, apparatus where that's filled with water. And what it does is, when you're doing exercises, you expend heat and you have to, as, as you expend the heat, it'll heat the water up in the, uh, in the chamber. So that's what happens is the walls of the chamber warmed by the heat from exercising subject and that's calculated by knowing the amount of water flowing through the chamber per minute and changes in water temperature from entry to exit. That's very costly. Now indirect calorimetry, we, we need to measure VO2 uh, uptake, 
oxygen uh, either in liters per minute or milliliters per kilogram of body weight per minute of exercise. Then we need to convert it to VO2 to kcals. So indirect calorimetry, it's a caloric density of carbohydrates, fats, proteins using a bomb calor calorimeter. What, what this is basically, you put food, uh, some kind of food in there, whether it's protein, it's carbohydrates, or it's fats. And you put it in this chamber and you pump it full of oxygen. And what you do, you basically ignite it. That's what it is, and it burns it. And once you burn this, it releases heat into water and it heats the, heats the, heats the temperature of the water up. And that what we can do from that, all the, whether it's carbohydrates, fats, or proteins, completely oxidized to, to carbon dioxide and water. And what we found out is that's where they get those uh, calorie, uh, um, kcals per gram of food that we have. So carbohydrates, we know it's if you if you oxidize it completely, it's got four grams or four calories per gram of uh, carbohydrate. For fats, it's nine calories per gram. For protein, it's four grams. That's where they get that. That's how they actually do that. Now another way of doing this is the caloric equivalent of oxygen. We're looking at calories per liter of oxygen. So what we found out is. What's the calories of energy produced when one liter of oxygen is consumed? So we look at one, if we, you know, burn uh, one liter of oxygen, if we know if we're burning calories, we'll use five calories. For fat, it's 4.7, and for protein, it's 4.5. It's 6% more energy produced when, when carbohydrates is used as a fuel. And why is that? Because if we look at, going back and looking at the intensity of exercise, if we're just at rest, we're burning mostly fat and not very much carbohydrates. As we increase the intensity of the exercise, our heart rate's going up, we're doing more work, so what do we, it shifts toward going from burning fat to more burning uh, carbohydrates. So that's why we would see that. That's about, so we know if, if we're burning a lot of liters of oxygen, we're gonna burn mostly carbohydrates. So we can actually calculate that. At 60 to 80 percent of VO2 max, the average calories produced per liter of oxygen is roughly 4.85, and that's rounded up to 5.0. So that's how we know: as you increase the intensity, you're going to burn more carbohydrates. So once again, that's that. This is that res respiratory exchange ratio. As we go along and increase the intensity of the exercise from zero to 100%. As you see, as we increase the intensity, where are we going at? We're going upwards, increasing intensity, heart rate goes up, muscles working more, using more fuel. We're gonna start, we need instant energy, so we're gonna burn carbohydrates because we need instant energy. And that's what this looks like. Now, look at the old measure of uh, measuring oxygen uptake. It's called a closed circuit. It's an old methodology. What we do, we're in a chamber, we're breathing in 100% oxygen. So we're also going to, uh, because we breathe in oxygen, and it's going to measure how much carbon dioxide we, we uh, exhaled as well, too. So some of the oxygen is consumed by the body, and the rest of it's going to return. So over time, the spirometer, the O2 in the spirometer is going to decrease, and we can measure how much oxygen is consumed during this particular time, or a period that we're, t we're seeing how much oxygen we're going to use. But this is the old methodology. The newer one is called an open circuit. This is the most common method. We take the oxygen inhaled versus the oxygen exhaled and how much oxygen consumed. So once again, the exhale, because we breathe in oxygen, and then we breathe out carbon dioxide. So CO2 is also calculated. And from this, we can calculate the RER, the resting uh, re respiratory exchange ratio, and therefore we can figure out how much, what type of fuel we're using. So this is the open, the open circuit that's most commonly used now. And how do we express energy expenditure? It's either in liters per minute for VO2, how much oxygen are we using in an exercise from zero to maximum intensity? 
This is also called absolute VO2. We can also measure it from calories per minute. The next one is still a VO2, but we're doing milliliters per kilogram of body weight per minute of exercise. This is called relative VO2. So the big difference between absolute overall, then we can break it down into relative per, per milliliter kilogram per minute of exercise. We also can do met. This is called a metabolic equivalent. It describes a standard or reference. So one met, if we're just at rest, we're using uh, a relative VO2, 3.5 milliliters of oxygen consumed per kilogram of body weight per minute of rest. Or per minute, yeah, per minute of rest. That's what that is. So that's at rest. So if we increase that, if we increase our heart rate and start doing more work, this is going to go up because we're going to start using more and more oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute of exercise. Then we also have calories burned per kilogram of body weight per hour. So let's look at this. Well, we have 10, if we burn, utilize 10 kcals per minute of exercise and we do 30 minutes of exercise, at 300 calories burned. However, we can also use, if we use the MET system, if we have seven METs times 30 minutes, we can calculate that, calculate that as 200 MET minutes. But then you have to take the milliliters, uh, uh, whatever the milliliters per kilogram of oxygen utilized per minute of exercise, we can calculate how much we used over that period of time and then calculate that in, into how many calories are burned. However, for health benefits, if we do 500 to 1,000 minutes per week equates to health benefits. So you can do it that way as well. The equations to estimate energy costs, there are so many tests to do. There are numerous tests with lots of equations. If you look at chapter six, you'll look in here and see all these calculations for uh, all these different uh, types of modalities for, for uh, aerobic activity. When you do walking, you have to count, but you have to factor into the speeds that we're at, the inclination of the surface. Is it flat or is it inclined? You also have to factor in how much you weigh. Uh, the speeds, the speeds is like how many, what the stride length is and how, how many strides per minute. For jogging and running, it's the same exact thing. How much do you weigh? What's the, what's the speed of movement? How many, how many uh, what's the uh, stride length? Strike frequency as well too, and the inclination of the surface. We can also do stepping, because that's a natural, normal human movement. We step up and down, we walk up and down stairs all the time. But you also have to do, there's different, there's different heights of the step for different tests. So you gotta look at that as well too. Then we have testing for lower versus upper extremity too. Cycle ergometry is what that's called. We also have to look too at the protocols that go along with this. Now walking and running could be either outdoors, you know, on the concrete or walking in a park or something, but it can also be on a treadmill or it can even be on an elliptical trainer as well. It just depends. So the protocols, you have to make sure that assuming no handhold, no handrail holding because this could overestimate your oxygen consumption because if you're kind of resting and holding yourself there, you might be able to do a little bit more work. We also have to assume similar movement economy. Some people, you know, you know, when, when they run or walk, they're very, very efficient. Other people will go all over the place. So you have to assume that everybody is very efficient in their movement patterns. There's also formulas both because this formula can overestimate VO2 for trained runners because they are much more efficient at running because they know how to run more efficiently than versus the novice person. We also have to assume a steady state of exercise. And the formula estimate that we use over here, lots of formulas. So a typical standard deviation from, from the norm is seven to nine percent plus, you know, for positive or negative. We have to calculate, we have to factor that in. The standard error of the estimate. We also have to assume that if you're using equipment, it's also that the machines is calibrated correctly. So if we look at, let's look at the cycle ergometry. If we look at that between leg and arm, for the oxygen cost, we have to factor in um, 
an unloaded, uh, we, have to, we have to calculate the unloaded cycling versus the loaded. But we have to combine these two together to get an estimate of how many uh, uh, milligrams of milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute of exercise. So these two have to be combined together in whatever formula it is for leg ergometry. For arm ergometry, it just has to be loaded, and it's three milliliters per kilogram meter done. So we have to look at how, how much it's spinning, how it is loaded versus factor in if it's unloaded as well. So the two have to be combined. The key point here is cycle ergometry is dependent on work rate. That's the pedal rate versus the resistance on the flywheel. Loaded versus unloaded, since it is non-weight bearing. The O2 requirement is in liters per minute, and it's great because it's the same for people of all sizes for the same work rate. That's why this, it can be a good estimate because everybody weighs the same. So if you're a lighter person, you might have to do more work than, than a heavier person. So it can be fairly accurate. Now the conclusion of this part is energy expenditure is important for all participants. Because if you look at that, if you have your nutrition in there, your exercise, how much are you taking in, how much are you expending. That's real important. Gives, an, gives one an estimation of how much work is completed. Because you get calories in coming out and versus calories going out. The more calories you have going out, that means you're doing a lot more work and you're expending more energy. Many different methodologies, but simplicity here is the key. Some formulas and protocols can be, can be quite complicated and as, as well as very expensive. So let's make sure you do this uh, as inexpensively but accurately as possible. Find the easiest, least expensive, but most accurate method to calculate energy expenditure and work completed. So let's take all this into it and let's move on to learn, learning module number four.